Happy Bank holiday Monday. I am just uh, going to record um, the talk from uh, yesterday uh, in the comfort of our family home. Um, the recording didn't work for us, unfortunately, on Sunday. Um, so I'm just going to roll with it uh, again in case you missed us on uh, Sunday and are looking to catch up. So the reading on Sunday was taken from John chapter 11, uh, beginning at verse uh, 17. So I'll read it uh, and then I'll share a bit from God's word. So it says this, On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come in to the world. After she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at her feet, his feet, and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man kept this man from dying? Jesus once more deeply moved came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there for four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands, his feet wrapped in strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Let's just pray as I share this message the second time around. Uh, so Heavenly Father, I, I want to thank you for everybody who was in church on Sunday and just, just the blessing that this word was to so many people. And I just pray for the guys watching at home who maybe missed out on Sunday uh, or even total strangers who are just tuning in. God, I pray that uh, this talk would be such a blessing to them uh, and really bless them where they're at on their journey with you. Amen. Uh, so we've been in the middle of an eight-week sermon series called Discovering uh, Jesus and we've been looking at what are known as the I Am 
statements of Jesus. So in the Gospel of John, if you've ever read it again and again, we see Jesus uh, making these sorts of statements about himself. And it's through these I am statements that we grasp who Jesus is and also what he does. These statements ultimately reveal to us that Jesus was God. So he said things like this, I am the bread of life in John chapter 6. And what he meant by that is, I am the only person who can truly fulfill you and sustain you. He said, I am the light of the world. I am the only one who can light the way to the kind of life that you're all looking for in a world of darkness. I am the gate. I am the only way to be saved. I am the good shepherd. I will protect you. I will lead you. I will even lay down my life for you. I am the resurrection and the life, the one we're looking at today. If you believe in me, death does not get to have the final say. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the way to your relationship with God. And finally, I am the vine. And that's an, that's an invitation to live a life of deep connection with Jesus. So this week we're in John chapter 11, one of our longer readings, uh, looking at how Jesus is the resurrection and the life. So let's dive in and try and get to grips with what Jesus is saying there. And the first thing we notice in this passage and observe is an all too familiar experience. In fact, it's a one in one experience because one out of one of us die. It's just a fact that we all face. What's more, we all experience grief and loss in our lives. The loss of a loved one, the loss of a family member, the loss of a friend. We've all experienced the pain of this in our lives. And perhaps even as I mention this right now to you, it's deeply painful for you. And for the most part, particularly in the Western world, we don't really like to talk about this. We tend to brush it under the carpet. I confess I do it too because it's unpleasant to think about both for ourselves and when we think of the pain of losing loved ones too. And so my question to all of us, um, you watching at home today, is have you thought about this? Or are you brushing this under the carpet? Have you thought about the wonder of Christian hope and the promise of life beyond the grave, of resurrection life? Because it's one of life's ultimate questions, what happens after death? And I believe that this I am statement of Jesus provides us with answers and offers us hope assurance, comfort and peace as well. Now, if you read the whole chapter, John chapter 11, it's pretty long. Word gets to Jesus in verse three that the one you love is sick. The one you love is sick. So clearly Jesus had a, a really deep uh, personal bond with this guy, Lazarus, for him to be described in such away the one you love is sick and we're told that Jesus does not do the expected thing so he doesn't pay the visit you know a huge expectation on the traditional rector vicar pastor minister is that they pay their visits to church members who are sick or in hospital or in the nursing home a huge part of the ministry of Jesus was praying for the sick but in the story, Jesus does not do the expected thing. He doesn't show up to pray for the guy. Instead, we read that he waits two more days and he doesn't seem to be in a huge hurry. And for some people, those verses that, that say Jesus waited, they're some of the hardest to take in the whole of the Bible. We ask Jesus, why aren't you rushing to get to Lazarus sooner? Even still, why aren't you rushing to be with this family who are going through the ringer? The least he can do is, is bring the tissues, 
by the card from the Faith Mission Books shop, the condolence card, sign it, and maybe even pray a prayer of comfort with this family. So what exactly is going on here? Well, I want to suggest that there's more going on here than meets the eye. So let's read verses 17 to 19 again. It says this, On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. <clears throat> so there's an important detail here in verse 17 and that is that Lazarus was already in the tomb for four days and this is sort of the key detail that you almost blink and miss because Many Jewish rabbis around about this time believed that a dead person's soul remained with the body in the tomb really for around three days and then would depart by day four. And Jewish people by this point would believe that death is completely irreversible. So it was kind of a superstitious kind of thought with no real grounding and evidence really. And so what Jesus wants to do here is speak into this, actually. People believed that after four days, death was irreversible, that it couldn't be stopped. And Jesus wants to show here that he has the power to reverse the irreversible and to bring resurrection life, that he has the power to defeat death itself and ultimately this miracle that he's going to perform will point to him being the son of God. So Jesus does eventually show up. By that point it is too late. When he arrives in verse 20 we hear that one of the grieving sisters Martha went out to meet him while Mary Magdalene remained at home in the depths of grief. And it's really in these two interactions with these two sisters we see two ways that Jesus helps us in that place of grief and loss and fear for even our own futures. So in verse 20, Martha is straight out of the blocks to see Jesus. And what we see actually aren't words of disappointment and anger at Jesus, but words of faith and hope in verses 21 to 22. She says this, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. So there's a sense in which Martha is as solid as a rock in her faith. She has assurance and peace about her brother who has died. And this stems from her faith. But she also has trust in Jesus that here is someone who can do something about this awful situation. But we also might say that she's putting on a bit of a brave face. And so Jesus responds in verse 23 with these words. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And for Martha, these words were just conventional words of comfort. Like you might say to someone going through the grieving process, you might say, well, they're not in pain anymore. They aren't suffering anymore. And especially to a Christian, you might say that the person has gone to be in the presence of Jesus and will rise again. And so Martha responds again, showing that she is a person of rock solid faith in verse 24. Martha answers, I know that he will rise again at the resurrection in the last day. So she is someone who believed in the resurrection that God would raise up the righteous dead again to life. This belief was fairly common among Jews, particularly among the Pharisees. And so Martha shows a fairly intelligent, faithful and hopeful understanding of the situation, actually. Her brother is gone, but she believes that God will raise him up again at the last day. And at this moment, Jesus is going to do something well beyond her expectations, well beyond her faith and her hope. So Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and 
the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. So what Jesus is saying in this moment is, I am the one who can give resurrection life to the dead. I can reverse the irreversible. I can end the curse on humankind seen right from the beginning of Scripture in Genesis chapter 3 at the fall. As Christians, I believe that we are called to this sort of faith and hope that Martha had in this moment. She didn't fully understand what Jesus could do for her in this moment. But here was faith and trust at the very least in the resurrection of her brother in the future. I'm reminded of Paul's words to the church in Thessalonica, where he reminds them of the hope of eternal life and resurrection of Jesus. He says this in 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning at verse 13. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of humankind with no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again and we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. And then if you continue to read on in that passage, he goes on to speak about how people will be resurrected from the dead into new resurrection bodies. You see, this sort of hope puts a different spin on things, doesn't it? You know, when people talk about the suffering question, why do people suffer? Why are people dying? Why are people in pain? It's the question that everyone asks, by the way. Every single Alpha course that we run in Tully Carnet Church, that is the question we get. But what we find is right at the centre of our gospel, we find that God is not aloof to this problem of suffering and death. It's right at the centre of the gospel. God has done something to deal with the suffering of death and sickness and disease. Jesus died and rose again to defeat the power of death itself. Should we trust in Jesus, death does not get to have the final say. There is the hope of resurrection in the future and of us rising again. Anglican minister writing hundreds of years ago, George Herbert, once said, Death used to be an executioner, but the gospel makes him just a gardener. Death used to be able to crush us, but now all death can do is plant us in God's soil so that we become something extraordinary. I'm very much reminded, and as I was preparing this this week, I was reminded of Tim Keller. Um, one of the most influential Christians, authors, church planters um, of the last century, who died just very recently. He had cancer and had been unwell for some time. And I'm struck by the simplicity of his words to his family. These are his last words. There is no downside for me leaving, not in the slightest. So here is someone who carried something of that Martha faith, and hope and I believe a whole lot more. Here's someone who fully understand the implications of Jesus' death and resurrection, what Jesus had done for him. It also puts a different spin on the fear that we can carry around us of death and of life itself. Though we die, we will be in Jesus' presence and we will be raised from the dead ourselves one day in the resurrection bodies. Have you this sort of trust in your life? Have you trusted in Jesus yet? Have you trusted in him as the resurrection and the life? Yet in Mary, in, in verses 28 to, to 37, we see a, a slightly different response to the death of Lazarus. It says this, picking up at verse 32, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was, and saw him she fell at his feet and said lord if you had been here my brother would not have died so she seems to be in the depths of grief and loss and i'm not saying that she did not carry the same 
the same faith as her sister Martha. I'm not saying that for a second here. The text doesn't suggest that. But in Mary's interaction, that theme of grief comes through particularly strongly. And we've all been in that place, haven't we? Where we ask, Jesus, where were you in that painful situation? Where we say, God, I can't feel your presence. I feel completely alone. I know that you're there, God, but I can't feel it. Or we say, Jesus, if only you had intervened, this person would not have died. Or this person wouldn't have suffered if you'd intervened. Or we ask, Jesus, I've seen you move in this area of my life. How come this area of my life is different? Why are you silent in this area of my life? Have you ever been in that place where you're wondering, Jesus, where on earth are you? Or even we can uh, be tricked into, into believing the lie that, that Jesus does not care about ourselves. It's very easy at this point to view Jesus as some sort of robot without feelings, isn't it? Because, I mean, he knew he was going to uh, raise Lazarus from the dead. He intentionally arrives a little later than we would expect. Yet this is not who Jesus was and Jesus is. He was both fully God and fully man. In fact, the passage when it speaks of Jesus' reaction um, in verse 33, Jesus' reaction to, to Mary's weeping and the others weeping, Jesus is described using a very specific word, embreomai which means literally he was deeply agitated. It can also mean to snort with indignation or displeasure. It can also suggest the idea of shaking with emotion. You see, Jesus here is in the presence of sickness and death. He's also in the presence of its impact on other people, the hurt that it causes, the pain that it causes. And it's here that we see the shortest verse in the entire Bible, verse 35, Jesus wept. We see that he is upset, that he is angry at death's hold on us. Ultimately at the cross, he would win the decisive victory over death and its oppression. But here he is, he is not a, a robot dispensing signs and wonders. Here is God in control. He knows what he's going to do. He knows that he's going to raise Lazarus. He knows that his death on the cross and his resurrection will defeat death and open up the opportunity for his followers to, to have eternal life with God and to be raised again. Yet here he is, God fully in control, here he is weeping with others. Hebrews 4, 15 to 16. In a context speaking about human struggles, human weaknesses, sinfulness, struggle with sin, says this. For we do not have a high priest, just talking about Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who was tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So that context there is speaking specifically about sin and struggles there. So if Jesus, I believe, is able to understand that, empathise with that and have sympathy with that, I also believe that extends to very valid, very natural emotions, completely natural responses such as grief because grief in loss is a very natural response to something very unnatural death so when we might struggle with someone not getting well again or better or even dying we might have a lot of questions about that we can know that Jesus understands experienced real grief and loss for himself 
and ultimately he came to do something about it. So death is a very common experience. We know that everyone uh, has experienced it to some degree. And we see that Jesus is the one person who decisively dealt with suffering and death as he is the resurrection and the life. The Christian faith does provide an ultimate solution to one of humankind's chief dilemmas. And what we also see is that in the midst of our grief, Jesus shares in our grief. He shares our indignation and our anger. Often as we go through the grieving process, we are angry. And he shares our pain and our sorrows. And ultimately, he gets the final say. And in the raising of Lazarus, he demonstrates his authority as the resurrection and the life. Let's pick up again at verse 38. Hmm. Jesus once more deeply moved note that, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across uh, the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of, of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. So tombs back then, they had a sort of cork and bottle style design. Um, the stone, the round stone at the top uh, would, would fit quite snugly over the front. And so Jesus asks this grieving family to have this stone removed can you imagine now martha who had faith and hope in the future for her brother certainly didn't see this one coming and and practical and sensible as always reminds jesus that there is a rotting body in there but jesus reminds her of the conversation that they have just had about him being the resurrection and the life you know for jesus this isn't an opportunity to show off his power it was his opportunity in line with what he had just said about being the resurrection and the life to demonstrate that authority over death is his. He wants to back up this bold claim so that, there, that those there can trust in him. So that those there can trust in him too and have this future hope as theirs and as well so that we can have this future hope too. And so, of course, Lazarus in our reading is raised from the dead, an amazing miracle. And in John's gospel, this is the final of Jesus' seven signs before he goes to the cross himself to die and ultimately to rise eternal from the dead. The ultimate sign that Jesus was the Son of God and able to defeat sin, death. And the devil. So how do we respond to this I am saying of Jesus, I am the resurrection and the life? On Sunday we got some of us to maybe for the first time trust in Jesus as the resurrection and the life. So maybe you don't know Jesus yet, maybe you haven't begun a relationship with him yet. We would love to lead you to him. Do you get in touch uh, and we can point you to him and show you how you can begin uh, to follow Jesus and begin a lifetime of following him too. Perhaps it's to invite people to our Hope Explored course or to come to our Hope Explored course. So uh, we, over three weeks, are going to be looking at this hopeful news that there is life eternal, that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and that he can give us hope for this world, resurrection, life, uh, for this existence now. Uh, so yeah do invite people along do come uh, along and if you would like to come along to the hope explored course do contact us over social media and finally we invited our members to meditate on two verses either from isaiah 25 8 or revelation 21 4 and really these verses describe the new heavens the new earth uh, they describe what it will be like when we're in resurrection bodies free of suffering death 
and pain. Maybe you're someone who worries about your future. These verses are great comfort and reminders of the hope that we carry as Christians. So hopefully you find this inspiring uh, and a little different to our Sunday recording. Um, and yeah, I hope that you're well. Do you feel free to get in touch with us uh, if you have any questions or want to go deeper uh, with God's word. So bless you. I hope you're well and do reach out to us if you need to.